All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the adult program coordinators here at the Nantucket Athenaeum. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Lincoln Thurber, uh, who works in reference, and Amy Janess, who's my boss and uh, leader in the adult programs department. So thanks for being here tonight. We're once again meeting for Yummy Monday, and tonight's theme was inspired. I saw it in the movies, in uh, dishes inspired by scenes from movies and TVs, TV shows. Um, so Lincoln, why don't you start us off? Uh, yeah, well, um, I was a big uh, fan of the uh, Game of Thrones. Um, oh, you got you got muted, Lincoln. Oh, poor cat. Uh, poor cat. Uh, so I was a big fan of the uh, Game of Thrones TV show, and so um, I was looking for something to make. So I decided to do my own version of uh, Dothraki blood pie. And so typically within the show, that would have been, um, it would probably have had horse in it, some kind of like horse meat, um, either turned into sausages, like blood sausages that we typically see from uh, cultures um, around the world. Uh, but I decided that since I couldn't get horse meat, um, and it's kind of hard on Nantucket to find blood sausages in the stop and shop. So I went with a mixture of lamb and goat <laughs> to, to replicate horses. Um, so uh, sort of my, uh, I, I also decided to decorate it with a handprint on the, on the top in, uh, in uh, Hungarian paprika. Uh, so uh, it was a fairly easy thing to make. I just uh, cooked all the meats, the goat meat, ahead of time and deboned it. Um, if you're familiar with getting goat meat from the uh, Stop and Shop, we has uh, bones in it, so I usually slow cook it uh, to remove the meat, and then um, I reserve the juices, and um, I also cooked up the lambs, um, and uh, for that. I made sure to remove the um, most of the fat from the lamb, since lamb fat is kind of a, a very very particular taste uh, that you don't want to maybe have. So um, it included uh, garlic, lots of garlic, shallots, uh, mushrooms, sort of um, uh, baby bella uh, mushrooms. And then I did a reduction of the um, uh, uh, goat uh, meat uh, kind of um, juices and uh, poured that over the top. And then I uh, had also boiled some potatoes. And so I decided to kind of put the potatoes on top of the meat and then kind of have the gravy on top of that. Um, and then I just put it in two crusts and uh, uh, the handprint for the top, it was just a little bit of uh, paprika and um, uh, some of the reserved uh, juices from the goat that I made into sort of, sort of a paint. So I did some finger painting on the top. Um, so that, that, was, that was my interpretation of it. It's actually quite good. Um, if you like goat and lamb and uh, kind of mushrooms, uh, it was very good. Uh, I think including, uh, along with the garlic, I did have um, a rosemary, uh, thyme, and sage. So it has a very uh, nice sage flavor to it. Um, in fact, it, it reminded me a lot of um, Thanksgiving stuffing because of all the sage that I had infused in the meat. So it was quite good. I'm eating it, uh, right? I've had it for two lunches and two dinners. Quite good. Did um, uh, did you follow any kind of recipe, or you kind of made it up as you went along? I kind of made it up with, as I went along. It, it it sort of has probably a closer connection with a pie, um, in some ways. I just didn't put the uh, beer um, in it, um, but uh, a lot of stout and um, beef pies have like kind of mushrooms and and things like that. So. And did you make the crust from scratch? I didn't make the, I didn't have enough time. Okay. So that, 
<laughs> Pillsbury. <Yeah. laughs> I also cut some corners. Yeah. Um, but, Good. Uh, yeah, I did. I did make my own roux to create the gravy out of the uh, uh, goat um, juices. So. <laughs> Um, and does anyone have any questions or comments for Lincoln? Now, what I don't think I've ever seen goat in our grocery stores here in Charleston. And what is it, dark meat, or what does it taste like? Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely a kind of a, a, a more savory. I'm not sure if anyone else here on Nantucket um, is a big fan of goat. Uh, I like curry goat. I'm a big um, a West Indian uh, curry fan. So um, I love all sorts of uh, things like that. Curried goat over rice and things like that. So um, yeah, Nantucket has um, uh, a good amount of goat usually in the uh, meat case uh, at all times, as well as chicken, oh, wow. all that. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that. Okay. It's tasty. <laughs> I like it. Okay. It yeah, I've cooked with it before. It reminds me, it's a little bit like lamb. Like it's a, okay. um, it's a very to me. It was it's kind of gamey. I did it with the stew. I don't know if I'd cook it. Um, like Lincoln said, you slow cook it. It'd be tough. To, I think it'd be tough to grill. Um, or roast. Yeah. The, well, the amount of goat that we get it all kind of chopped up in like one inch chunks. So it's, it's kind of hard to do uh, much with it except stew it um, here on the island. I was looking for a picture of the blood pie from Game of Thrones, but the pictures are pretty <laughs> graphic. <laughs> so you can look it up on your yeah, own. <laughs> I, yeah, I've, I've seen all sorts of recipes um, online as well. Many people have replicated it. Um, in all different ways. One one I saw was very much looked like a beef Wellington. Um, and so people have done kind of uh, small uh, hand held pies, you know, sort of that um, typical English pub food um, type. So everyone's done different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do it like that, you might be able to make a bunch and, and freeze them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our neighbor owns a, a hunting lodge and they do a lot of hunting here in South Carolina and um, they have game but it's like deer and it's all kinds of uh, birds and but you know not goats. So. <laughs> <laughs> they don't go out shooting goats. It's, it's, as far as I know, I don't know. I, well, I don't in South Carolina, I'm sure somebody goes out and shoots goats. They probably do something. They're not supposed to. But not in Charleston. I, I think you'd be uh, hurting people's farm animals if you shot goats out here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments for Lincoln? All right. Well, thank you, Lincoln. You're uh, Amy, are you ready to share? I am. Um, I picked the movie Chef because my two favorite movies about food are Big Night and Chef, and Janet already took Big Night. Um, so Chef is available on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. And I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I don't want to give it away, but basically it's a road trip movie in a food truck. Um, and it's got a great oh. cast. It's got uh, Sofia Vergara, it's got Scarlett Johansson, it's got Dustin Hoffman, it's got uh, John Leguizamo, it's got all kinds of great people in it. And um, so one of the key aspects of the road trip is, um, so the main character is a character played by John Favreau, who's also the director and the writer of the film. And he's gone on to do really well as the director of all the Iron Man films. He's not really known as an actor. He's more known as a director, but he's super passionate about food. And um, so he goes across the country in this food truck with his son, and his son insists that they have to take a detour and go to New Orleans and have beignets. So I picked beignets, 
And unlike Janet and Lincoln's, mine were incredibly easy and took five minutes. Um, but I don't know if anyone has been to New Orleans. Um, oh, yeah. Let me just find, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you, I think this will work. I'm just going to show you a two minute video. Um, so Cafe Du Monde is right in the historic part of New Orleans at the edge of the French Quarter. And you go in the morning and you have beignets, which are kind of like a fritter slash donut. They're fried and they're sweet. And then um, Cafe <laughs> also has famous chicory coffee, which you you make it so it's half milk and half coffee because it's really strong. Um, so here's just a quick little look, Cafe Du Monde, how they make their beignets, what a beignet is, and then I'll tell you about my experience. Oh, wait. I think I was supposed to click some buttons here before I did this. Share sound. And uh, uh, uh. hold, please. There we go. Okay, Let's try that again. And other sugar topped fried pastries. But those who've been to Cafe Du Monde know them as a thing all their own. It's our like decadence, it's, it's who we are. I mean, it's everything about it. You come here, it I can't describe it. I'm just looking at it because it's like heaven in a bag. Beignets start out as a simple pastry dough at Cafe Du Monde, where the bakers are meticulous in the way they mix each batch. Mix until it get all the lumps out until it get smooth. It's about 10 minutes, the most. As for what's inside that mixture? I, I can't tell you that's a secret. <laughs> Based on the ingredient list from Cafe Du Monde's own beignet mix, the dough is made with wheat and barley flours, buttermilk, salt, and sugar. Once it's fully combined, only touch can tell whether it's ready. I check it to make sure it's, it's the right feeling for it to throw. I don't want it too soft, I want it just right. I don't want it too hard. See, I have to feel it. If I make it too stiff, beignets will start to shrink up. Then Curtis puts the dough through a rolling machine. I'm rolling it down so I can run it through the cutter, brush the excess flour off, get it ready to go into the grease. You ever burn yourself or not? Uh, plenty of times. Still had the marks on my arm. Cafe Du Monde fries beignets in cotton yeah. oil because... It's like a peanut oil. The grease doesn't burn that fast. You know, you it at temperature. You'll see oh, Curtis shake the squares yeah, continuously as the pastries cook. I'm, I'm separating them so they won't stick together, so all of them come out. In five minutes or less, the beignets are puffy and golden brown. At this point, wait for the waiters to come in and bag them up and take them out to the window. They serve. Shovels of powdered sugar empty into the bags immediately after the beignets leave the fryer. That's when the sugar easily clings to the surface and when the pastries taste their best. Listen, you have to get them hot, like extremely hot, because it's like, you see that? Like, it's so airy and light. I gotta take another bite. It's so good. <laughs> Better than a donut way better than a donut. It's just soft and chewy and excellent. And we always wear black so that we can have powdered sugar all over us and everybody knows where we've been. Most customers like a lot of sugar. They, they like a lot. Do they come back asking for more? Yes, they do, all the time. All the time. Cafe Du Monde has been open in the French Quarter for almost 160 years, all the while serving the same two items on the menu. With some black coffee, it's just like the perfect combination. Yeah, it's a perfect it's mixture of tart and, and sweetness that it kind of just, it totally combines with each other. And for decades, food publications, famous figures, and customers from all over the world have praised the sweet fried dough. There are a few things that you think of New Orleans immediately, the river, the cathedral, Pat O'Brien's Hurricane maybe, a Cafe de Mont Beignet. This is what you come to New Orleans for. First stop when we get to New Orleans. This is on the list of where we got to go. Even if you don't like beignets, you kind of have to try it because it's just part of the, the New Orleans tradition and history. Now I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, so 
I sent away for Cafe Du Monde beignet mix and Cafe Du Monde coffee. Um, so this is the finished product with the coffee. Um, and then, so here's the mix in the confectionery of sugar. And this and some water is all you need to make them. You just add water to the mix. Uh, you roll it out. You cut them. And then I find mine in canola oil, but any kind of vegetable oil. They go really fast. Um, they take, they cook in no time whatsoever. So I, I stepped away from my first batch and I shouldn't have. You got to kind of stand right over them. Um, but just take them out and put them on some paper towels and put sugar on them while they're still hot. And you got to eat them while they're hot because once they get cold, they're just kind of like hockey pucks. Um, so that's my story. How much oil did you, it looks like you just coated the bottom. Did you actually fry them in a couple inches of oil? The direction said in a half inch of oil. So it wasn't like a deep fried like they showed in the video. Um, mm -hmm. And it, they did absorb a fair amount of oil, um, but they weren't, they, did, they weren't greasy. They're crunchy on the outside and then soft and cakey on the inside. They reminded me of a fritter, kind of, but they tasted a little bit like a donut. Mm -hmm. So if I, it got me to missing New Orleans. <laughs> so if you need a Mardi Gras fix or a New Orleans fix, I recommend the beignet. You have to send away for the mix. Um, the internet says they carry it at Walmart, but it, and I was off island last weekend and I looked for a Walmart that I could get to and they, they didn't carry it. So I ended up ordering it um, from Amazon. And then the last thing I'm gonna say is if you like the movie Chef and you like food cooking shows, uh, on Netflix, John Favreau and his um, his chef, um, I don't know what you call it, chef guru on the film was Los Angeles chef Roy Choi. So there's a show on Netflix that they do together called The Chef Show. And it's the two of them cooking. It's a cooking show. And uh, so the first season, they recreate all the dishes that were in the movie. And I think they're on season three or four now. And so they've just sort of gone off from there. And sometimes they visit um, celebrity chefs like David Chang and Wolfgang Puck. Sometimes they go out and they look at the food truck scene in LA. And I don't know, it's kind of all over the place. But if you like food shows, it's very entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, Amy lent me her mix. So I'm going to give it a well. And then I have to be careful with my caffeine intake, but I am going to try <laughs> chicory coffee. Well, it's half milk and half coffee. So yeah, I'll be all right. Pretty good. I'll have half a bath. Cool. Does anyone have any questions for um, Amy or comments? All right. Lincoln, you're muted if you're talking. Yeah, Amy. Um, so like, um, you know, obviously the ones in New Orleans was were better, but did, did you feel like it was a, a, a close approximation for made you made you happy? Yeah, I think, you know, if I did them again, I they said to cut them in two by two squares. And I was, I, I don't think I knew what two inches was. I thought I did when I, when I cut them. And then they came out really small. So uh -huh. I think if I did a second time, they'd come out better. I, you know, I'd cut them a better size and I'd cook them better. But yeah, mm -hmm. it definitely tasted you know, um, I just missed sitting outside under the tent at Cafe Du Monde. That was the part I couldn't recreate. Now, did you try any of the beignets that are on Nantucket? I'm not sure which um, bakery does them, but. Oh, well, Island Kitchen does, I think. Island Kitchen does them? Okay. Yeah. But the ones I've had are more like donuts. Like they're beignet, they might be like that beignet, but they're cut like donuts. Okay. I think. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, so as Amy said, I uh, took big night. Um, oh, there's a question in the chat, Amy. Is using the beignet, uh, beignet mix the only way to make them? Is it possible to... Um, I think if you did a lot of research, you could probably find a recipe 
But the Cafe Du Monde recipe is proprietary. They don't tell you what it is. So I just decided to go for the, the tried and true. OK. So um, as Amy said, I decided to <laughs> go big. Um, and I did big night. Um, wait, hold on, let me move some of my windows around. Let's see. Um, so I actually was pretty nervous about making this. So I said it out loud over and over again. So I'd have no choice but to make it. Um, and I actually watched this movie for the first time recently. If you haven't seen it, um, it's available on Canopy, which is the streaming service available through the library with your library card. Um, so I had watched the movie and I decided in it that I wanted to make timpano, um, which is this dish right here. And if you watch the movie, it's really quite funny to watch them making it and they obsess over it and they're tapping on it. And, um, and then they bring it out as the pièce de résistance in the, the um, dinner scene. So uh, this recipe was actually quite easy to follow. Um, I can put a link to it in the chat. And there were some good comments that were helpful um, about how long to let it cool and, um, you know, in terms of layering and the size of the bowl and stuff. So I found this recipe very easy to use. So I'll go ahead and put this in the chat. Um, there you go. Okay. So it did, I cut some corners, but it did require some, um, a, a good amount of prep work. So let's see, let me, I'm trying to share too much. Here we go. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that? So, um, so this is basically what's going to be the layers. So you have 12 boiled eggs. It was four cups of provolone that I just bought the deli like sliced and then chopped it up. This is um, four cups of salami. Once again, I just bought the sliced deli salami and chopped it up. Um, I did not make the sauce. I just, it was a little, <laughs> it just seemed daunting to have to make the sauce, but there is a recipe, a New York Times recipe that they give a link to if you wanna make your own sauce. And I, I did cheat and buy frozen meatballs, um, which was helpful. I got the half ounce um, because they are meant to be bite size because you're going to layer them throughout. So I got frozen meatballs and just brought them to, uh, thawed them to room temperature. Um, so that I did all ahead of time just so I'd have it ready to go. And then I made the dough. The dough was, I think it was four eggs and four cups of flour and some salt and then just a little bit of water. So as I started rolling it out, I've worked with pie dough. I'd never worked with dough like this before. So I was actually kind of, this is what was giving me the most stress because if you don't seal it, it goes everywhere. So I was really nervous about getting the dough flat enough and pliable enough, but not tearing. Um, so it took a while, but as you can see, I finally rolled it out. So it needed to be, the diameter needed to be about 30 inches. And I give you the measurements based on the bowl you're gonna use. And um, I actually, oh, I haven't cleaned it yet. So I used, it was, um, they call for a baking pan. I actually went to Island Variety and bought, um, it's like a basin, um, but it, it's, I think like an aluminum, enamel aluminum, and it worked fine. So once that was rolled out, I placed it. Once again, it wasn't that hard to work with this dough. It didn't really tear, it held up really well. So I, you grease it with oil and butter and then you place the bread in there because you don't want it to stick. That'd be really, really bad. I draped it over. And then you start layering. So I did a layer of, oh, and I pre-cooked pasta, but you'll cook the pasta only half the amount that the directions call for. So I cooked the pasta for about five minutes. You want it really al dente um, because it's gonna cook more and absorb more liquid as you bake it. So it's a layer of pasta and some sauce. Um, and then you have your salami, your cheese, your boiled eggs, your meatballs, and some Romano. Um, and then you start over again, you do more pasta, oh, and sauce, and then you do more pasta and more sauce and more cheese and salami and meatballs. So you do a bunch of layers. And then this part was a little tricky, but it ended up working out. I folded it up and you kind of have to cut away a lot of dough and then really pinch it. It's really important that it, it seals because that's what holds the everything together. So I got it all together. Um, 
and then uh, put it in the oven and baked it for a half hour. Um, and then you cover it with aluminum foil and you bake it for another hour. And then I pulled it out and you kind of shake it like this, just make sure it didn't stick, which it didn't, thank God. Um, and then you let it cool. So at that point, I think I let it cool for about an hour. Um, and now I have a couple videos to share. So this was, let me, so this was me turning it out. This was, this was kind of probably the most nerve wracking part because I did it on a cutting board. So if it split open or it didn't hold, it went everywhere. Oh, and you do pour some egg, um, you beat four, I think six eggs and pour it over the top. Um, so here we go. There it is. Action. I don't know how much I can do it. I should have rehearsed this. One, two. <laughs> there it is. Ah, no. All right. Wow. That looks pretty good. Let's see. So it has to sit for another hour. <laughs> no, it doesn't crack. Stay in there. It'll stay. All right, I'll cut. So that was when I turned it out. And I had little pockets of steam, like little cracks. But for the most part, it held up. Um, and then here's the final video. The, the moment of truth when you cut it open. Let's see, where is it? It's this one. Is the light okay there? Light's perfect. So I'm gonna do, 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 do. So they tell you to cut a circle in the middle uh, okay. that helps you you, helps maintain its shape so when you're cutting do, slices off. Uh, sketching. That's three inches, but. A little smaller than I think what the picture was. Feels solid as I'm cutting into it. Okay. Apparently, this creates stability. Did you slice it? Okay. Now I'm gonna slice it. Where do you want me to slice it? Yeah. It's good? Mm -hmm. Okay, I might just go everywhere. Amazing. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> so that was um that was my tempano that I made. Um and it was actually having made it once, um it actually wasn't that hard. Like it seems like this really daunting, overwhelming dish. It really wasn't that hard. I find some friends because it serves 16. And I did notice um, I had a lot of the layers left over. Like I did, I think I did three layers. Um, so I ended up using, I think like half the eggs that it called for and maybe half the meatballs. I used most of the salami and most of the cheese. So, and most of the sauce, but I had a ton of pasta left over. So I think that's just something you have to eyeball, but I didn't mind because you can freeze the pot. Like I could make something out of the pasta and freeze it. Um, but I had a lot of leftover like layer ingredients. Um, but overall I thought it came out the way, uh, I thought it would. So 
with my tympano. Does anyone know how to pronounce it? Is that right, tympano? I don't know. Would you make it again? I would, but I would make it if um, I knew who I was going to share it with. Because <laughs> I don't know that it would freeze well. Um, and I found myself running around giving tempano out to everyone because <laughs> we didn't want to, I mean, it's just so heavy, like the meatballs and the meat and the cheese and the pasta and then it's wrapped in dough. So it's, um, it was delicious, but it's not something I would want like to eat for five days. So I would probably do it if it was like a, a special occasion where a lot of people could eat it, but it held up. I mean, we had it today and I feel like it'll be good. It would hold up for like a few days and it does sort of like meld together uh, like a lasagna, like it, you know, it kind of the flavors marry. So I would make it again. It's right. such an unusual combination of, you know, hard boiled eggs mm -hmm. and meatballs. Everything else kind of makes sense, but the hard boiled eggs kind of threw me a little bit. Yeah. Did you, did you like it, Amy? What'd you think of it? Very much, especially on a bitter cold day. It was great. Yeah. And we had some right away. I do recommend um, if you have a little extra time heating it up in like a toaster oven or the oven. Um, we did it in the microwave and it was fine, like did it for a minute or whatever, but the toaster oven would be nice because then the dough gets nice and crispy. The dough did get a little bit tough, um, but it was still edible. It was still fine. So what's the movie about other than this dish? Oh, the movie's great. It's really fun. It's... Um, Tony Shalhoub, who's known now for Miss Maisel and who's in Wings, and uh, he played um, the guy with OCD. Um, Monk. 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 Yeah. So he's in it, and I think it's one of his first movies, and uh, uh, Stanley Tucci, and they play these Italian brothers that came to the U.S. to open a restaurant, and Stanley's kind of the businessman, and Tony Shalhoub is the chef, and he's very temperamental and a little bit of a diva. And their restaurant's empty because they want to do real Italian food. And meanwhile, another guy from Italy had moved and opened a restaurant across the street. And he does spaghetti and meatballs and he has music every night. And they just feel like he sold out to like America's version of Italians. And um, so they have this one final big night where they think the singer's going to come and they invite all their friends. But it's interesting to see who's in it because Alice and Jamie's in it. And um, um, mini drivers in it, and a bunch of people I had known. So it's it's just it's really good, food. like just it's fun to um, do all the food because this is just one dish. They do course after course after course of Italian food. It's amazing. And was the movie made in the eighties or the nineties? Um, I feel like it was maybe the late eighties. Let me look it up. Um, it looks like late eighties, early nineties. Oh no, it's much later. Uh, it's 96. For some reason, when I was watching, maybe because it's kind of an independent film, um, <laughs> looks a little more dated than that, but no, it's 96. Um, yeah. Did anyone else make something inspired by movies? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, any other thoughts, questions, comments? I'm trying to think of other movies where food is, you know, one of the main storylines. Mm -hmm. I guess there's one with Bradley Cooper. Yeah, there's the chef one with Bradley Cooper. Yeah. Well, I would throw, I'd suggest Soil and Green, but... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? So people, so, yeah. what was I actually, oh, I'm sorry I actually had a comment um it's I'm actually really a New Yorker even though I'm now in Connecticut but I lived in New York for 26 years and so when I was thinking about this obviously I thought about when Harry met Sally and Katz's delicatessen of course <laughs> um so that came to mind and the fact that also, again, I'm not a New Yorker, so I really don't cook very much. So I just really love the scene in Annie Hall when they're make, they're boiling the lobsters, <laughs> which is something I can do, but that's about it. 
Those are my comments. I'm sorry if I interrupted someone. No, no. I had watched, I didn't, uh, in all honesty, I didn't get all the way through it, um, but I was watching the Danish film Babette's Feast, which someone had recommended, um, which was good, but it was just kind of a long, dreary winter movie. <laughs> I was like, I want to watch something where people are warm. Um, but it was good. And the chef, the woman, the servant makes this, um, they live in this like remote area of Denmark and she brings in all this food and ice and quail and everything and creates this um, magnificent French feast. Um, so I didn't watch all of it, but it was, it was good food watching. Yeah. Well, all right then. Um, I've asked before and I have a few things lined up. Actually, I'm gonna reach out to a chef about doing, um, Amy and I actually independently had this idea of uh, how to take care of your knives and sharpen your knives and perhaps some tips on chopping. Um, yeah, that'd know. be good. Yeah. And, um, and then next week, as I said, we have um, Deepak, oh, I forget his last name. Um, he's going to be doing chicken curry and um, basmati rice. He's originally from Nepal, so um, he'll be doing his own style. Um, of a home cooked uh, chicken curry meal, which will be good. I think he's uh, he's like, oh, I'll need the full hour because I'm doing prep work and everything. So I think it's going to be quite a show. <laughs> um, and he'll talk about. He said, I don't know the name for all the spices in English, but he'll share what they are, and we can uh, figure it out and go get them. Um, and then I have a few other things I'm working on. But if you have any requests or suggestions. I'll put my email in the chat um, and you can send them my way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy, Lincoln, do you have anything to add? Nope. Thank you very much for sharing. I liked it's fun. This was a fun challenge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. This well, fun. thank you. Yeah, yeah, please come back. We're going to be doing it weekly and um, I'm trying to mix it up, have different things, different weeks. So um, check in again. I wish I'd seen this earlier. I would have tried to dig something up from a recipe. <laughs> like, uh, Me too. Yeah, Ju Ju Julian Julia's the Bourguignon there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was on my radar too. <laughs> Good. Next time. You did it. How about a yummy Monday with a, a professional chef on the kitchen equipment they can't live without? Ooh, yeah, that'd be good. I'd be yeah. curious, you know, if it's if it's simple or or what they what what they recommend. Mm -hmm. I just yeah, got a version good. blender for Christmas, and I don't know how I lived without it. It's amazing. Yeah, I think about that. We just got a stand mixer um, and we don't have a terribly big apartment or a lot of storage. So there's things I want that I would get, but then it's like, do we really need it? And where are we going to stick it? And how often are we going to use it? Yeah. I think in South Carolina, the most treasured thing would be a cast iron frying pan that's handed down from generation to generation, seasoned for generations. Yeah, Larry, were you, were you guys here last week? Because Grant Sanders did a presentation on cast iron pans. No, no, I missed it. But um, yeah, that's in the South. That's my you know when my mother passed away, my little sister is the one that grabbed the the, the frying pan because she's the one that does the most cooking. But um, she got it from her mother, I think. So it had been well seasoned for generations. Yeah, Larry, yeah. I'm so glad to hear somebody else from South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Charleston. Mount Pleasant, oh, actually. I'm in Columbia. Okay. Oh, wow, really? I went to USC. <laughs> okay, how about that? But I love Nantucket. If, I, if we could afford to live in Nantucket, I, I can't think of any place I'd rather be. Yeah, in July. <laughs> Go there yeah. in July. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also love Charleston and go, go, you know, take the drive down every chance we get. 
Good food. Well, we we have real good friends in Colombia, so we're going into the capital. We go up there too. <laughs> but this is always fun. So thank you. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, hopefully we'll see you next week or a week in the future. Um, thanks for being here, and we'll see everyone soon. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. You, thank you so much. It was so inspiring. <laughs> thanks for coming, Jen. It was good to Bye. see you. Bye. See you soon. Bye, everyone. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's eat. Exactly. <laughs>